Hi, I'm John I. Freeman and welcome to POTS Part 2, The Project, a story of Bacon and his devotees. Though my research may only skim the surface, with all the resources and material online, what is at least possible with Bacon now is an injection, a spear of light into the main vein. Peter Dawkins, the guru, and his FBRT site is an incredible resource for everything Bacon. Equally outstanding is Laurel, Lawrence Gerald's site, SirBacon.org. Other influential players, Simon Miles, Richard Allen Wagner, and Susan Roberts. Susan McIlroy and Bryony Rawls' research on Mrs. Pot, along with Peter Amundsen's cipher studies, are instrumental to the project. Ross Jackson's book, Shaker of the Spear, the Francis Bacon story, is a wonderful example of how powerfully Bacon's story can be brought to life by giving the sources a voice. Daphne du Maurier similarly breathes life and colour into the brotherhood of Essex, Anthony and Francis. The following is an outpouring of what I've discovered in the form of a proposal, a starting point. There is also a paper, A Beast, which burrows deeper, should you be interested. Of Delia Bacon, not related, dubbed the woman who hates Shakespeare, the following has been said. For too long, critics have, has de have depicted her as a tragicomic figure, blindly pursuing a fantastic mission in obscurity and isolation, only to end in silence and madness. This is not to say that the stereotype is without basis. On the contrary, her sad story established an archetype for the story of the Shakespeare authorship at large or at least one element of it. An otherworldly pursuit of truth that produces gifts for a world that is indifferent or hostile to them. My perspective, for what it's worth, is that it's not that we're un-Shakespeare, it's more that we love the works, instructing us as they do in lessons of nature on a cosmic and human level. This love is more wholly realised in recognising that they are, they are a part of something greater. Delia's story offers, a great, offers great motivation for change. Another pertinent personality has to be old mate J. Thomas Looney, schoolmaster come doubter. In his book Shakespeare Identified, he works the text like a drama teacher detective to identify characteristics of the author. Legend! But he was a loony. Another perfect embodiment of the Potts phenomenon. For the sake of humour and courage, if our character is attacked, if we're called mad, why not embrace it? After Peter meets with Stratfordian Stanley Wells, he says, he thinks I'm a lunatic, and that inspires me. Or is it time to show that maybe we're not so crazy after all? Do we remain anonymous at large and branded crazies, or respond, win some hearts and change some minds? Let's get loony. If a man will begin with certainties, he shall end in doubts. But if he will be content to begin with doubts, he shall end in certainties. Sir Francis Bacon. One of my Bacon iPhone experimentations with a significant message. This project challenges us to see how far we've come since Bacon in our ability to weigh and consider. As far as Shakespeare is concerned, the Stratfordian facade has certainly reached dizzying heights. The Rylance incarnation of Bacon is amazed that it survived as long as it has, but he also has hope for discoveries, if they are accepted as discoveries, highlighting our crucial struggle. What should it do? Why should it be made? Why Bacon now? The newly created Shakespeare Authorship Mystery Day, instituted by the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship, commemorates the initial publication of the first folio as an alternative to the birthday of the man in the picture we've all been so concerned with. In this same spirit, I believe 2023, the folio turning 400, should be the year of the project. This, this collection is the crowning piece of the efforts of many, and celebrating the birth of this pot may provide a more suitable focus. Glenn Richardson, quoting Lord Donaldson, said, But do we not have a duty to the truth? The Shakespeare Bacon Enigma video presents research into cipher codes within Shakespearean text, revealing messages of his authorship and also his Tudor heritage. I believe through his work, Bacon sought a day in posterity where he would be fully understood, credited and unburdened by the disgrace of his fall. 
We continue to be met with reasons to question Bacon's involvement in the Shakespeare works. It's ignorance, the serpent, that drives the conflict here. Beautifully, what this story provides, Bacon's story, is love and hope in times of struggle. Mark Rylance, in cracking the Shakespeare code, raised a valid point. If the authors wish to be concealed, are we going against this in seeking them out? I believe Bacon would bless our efforts to doubt and investigate. Francis wrote, let great authors have their due, as time, which is the author of all authors, be not deprived of his due, which is further and further to discover truth. In allegory and code, I believe he asks us to set him free in Tempest, his redemption in legacy. Problem is, Bacon has become too hidden, perhaps a culmination of faded occurrences, his cover along with his exit from government. Additionally, he has been the victim of character assassination and misrepresentation, also distancing him from the question. Bardolatry perpetuated by Stratfordians, popular culture and academia, has seen the mask or myth grown too powerful so as to go against the principle in which it was created as a unifying force to see the works and not the person. What does I Am Shakespeare's Bacon have to say about it? Modern scholarship credits an ill-educated, bookless actor of dubious financial dealings and ardent Catholicism and, and now must make the plays fit that man's rather limited mind. This is what concerns me, says Bacon. I'm pretty certain then he wouldn't break out the party hats at Shakespeare being voted Man of the Millennium in 1999. Rediscovering Bacon. It's tempting to see Bacon as having all the answers. Thomas Carlyle would say that he was one of the few who could converse with the universe firsthand. Pott expresses a desire to walk and talk with Bacon. Somehow she came to know him and see him. He was so alive in her imagination. Though noble, there is also something tragic about a life so concealed. It brings heightened gravity to Bacon's public shame, sent to the tower at the prime of his political career. We should be thankful, though, that Bacon had his fated fall, for it provided us with his literary children. In poor finances, he finishes his scientific works, which make him extremely influential as a father to modern science. The series can offer an impression of Bacon's vulnerability, his emotional turmoil, and most of all, his humanity. The lighter shades of Bacon must also be explored ready to share a laugh, not at all the reserved and revered lawyer and statesman of commonplace conception. We know that he enjoyed a good party, was generous and spent too much, but by contrast he was also the penniless poet, recognised only within select circles during his lifetime. It was Bacon's wish to let love rule in all things. Despite being alone and betrayed in his final moments, his intellect lifts him out of the haze to create something mean meaningful. Like the phoenix, we witness sacrifice and rebirth. My contribution. To me, the next step for Bacon is a piece for screen about truth, finding it, and love in action, charity and mercy. Sharing this message about the need for a wide-reaching creative project about Bacon with others marks the beginning of my own contribution. Francis was a collaborator, believing it was best if men worked together in order to be more productive. So this video is also a call to arms, as the project will need collaborator knights and patrons to shake the spear. Artistic vision. The Virginia Woolf biopic, The Hours, and its beautifully shot, concurrently linked narratives is a good frame of reference for our project. RC expert Thomas Churton says that Bacon lived dangerously and that he would have left clues. Pott's treatment of cipher and code should adopt the creed by the mind I shall be seen as a challenge to find, read and highlight these clues. Sequences from films such as The Da Vinci Code and A Beautiful Mind demonstrate the allure of codes, symbols and art which may feature within a narrative and be brought to life visually in compelling, arresting and imaginative ways. As well as the imagery of emblems, signatures and devices, the piece should also contain a, a, mot a motif of notes and note-taking. 
Notes are both, both a form of pot and part of the legacy of authors. Consider Bacon and his promus, Latin for storehouse or depot. When Potts' research moves out of the margin, her labours generate 130 boxes of full scat paper. Time. 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 Time's glory is to calm contending kings, to unmask falsehood and bring truth to light. The Rape of Lucrece. Crossing between three periods or layers of time, three generations of Baconian thought are explored. The layers are accompanied by three voices, narrating and making discoveries. They are intertwined. A thread can be picked up by another. Each devotee is in the consciousness of the other. This creates tension, highlighting deep emotional connections between them and their respective struggles. Bacon's story finds its source in the lives of the sisters, working alone, in meetings, lectures, online, casual conversations, or in the thick of arguments. I picture other moments of crossover that developed through the series where the three protagonists share geographical and or metaphysical spaces, particularly during the pilgrimage both sisters make to important Bacon locations. Gorenberry is one such pivotal space. The Lives. Life of Contemporary Researcher, or CR. This character and narrative is a construction, an embodiment of modern research, coming from a Shakespearean point of view. She works or teaches at a university, and her conflict lies with a mentor representing orthodox academia, who admonishes her for sharing her opinions with students. An actor friend introduces her to the authorship question, showing her a video, a video on the Dreschaut engraving, which makes a puzzle of the most iconic portrait of Shakespeare. She finds Bacon shortly afterwards through a short pot paperback. She is also an, av an avid cryptologist, which she utilises during her work on the folio. She gives voice to the minds of the future that Pot worked so hard for. She must show the advances, the fight further on, alongside of the same, of the same attitudes and struggles Baconians continue to be met with. Life of Pot. What is truth? said Jesting Pilot and did not stay for an answer. That was delicious. A nine-year-old Constance Ferron reads Bacon's essay on truth and is a Baconian thereafter. She has a special affinity with Bacon, coming from a different vantage point to CR. Mrs. Henry Pott was likely one of the closest to knowing Bacon through her unrivaled dedication to his promus. Unaided, she translates and transcribes all entries, publishing in 1883. This task, undertaken without technology, is astounding. Pott discovered that Bacon and Shakespeare have 40,000 metaphors and similes in harmony as identified in five major works of study. The line from Merchant of Venice, all is not gold that glisters, is one also found in the Promus, and it's such a glistering find. Life of Bacon. For my name and memory, I leave it to men's charitable speeches and to foreign nations and the next stages. The main subject of the piece should be the great and many-sided Bacon. Dawkins reveals that Bacon's mind was so active and his capacity for work was so enormous he would have a secretary sit by his bed while he slept so that he could dictate his dreams as soon as he woke. Rawley tells us that he was ever a countenancer and fosterer of another man's parts. Edwin A. Abbott wrote, his style varied almost as much as his handwriting. Few men have ever shown equal versatility in adapting their language to the slightest change of circumstance and purpose. It is so exciting to imagine a, a representation of this figure. I wouldn't even really like to speculate on someone worthy of the task. Ben Johnson writes a remarkably similar eulogy for Bacon as he does for Shakespeare in the folio. A meticulous and critical poet who always chose his words, descriptions and analogies carefully, he is undoubtedly referring to the same person. Moments of Bacon. Johnson said that Bacon could, Bacon could never pass up a jest, and the moments we share with him should always possess this quality. He also talked about Bacon's command of attention when he spoke, likely one of the greatest speakers of all time. Bacon's connection with science should be explored here, also as a link to the Shakespeare works. In our project, Bacon's love and respect for nature is made manifest in his knowledge and abilities with gardens. 
where in a delightful metaphor, he particularly enjoyed grafting to produce new varieties. Francis planned the layout of the gardens at Twickenham Park and Gorhambury, and this is uh, a gift of his that's very important to our rendering. In the daylight hours, I see him in the garden, in the ear of, his, uh, in the, ear of the sisters as they tend their own. In the evening, I picture our protagonist stargazing, bacon atop the mount at Prey Hill, nearby to his magical house. How the series should look. The cinematography and sets of the project should adhere to a humble, stark simplicity in which everything has meaning. Symbolism is important as a way to link the three time periods, integrated via motifs. Each period should also be accompanied by a soundtrack exploring Bacon's theme a light motif layered with instruments and sounds of the relevant age. I see the motifs being represented through creative animation, a translation of period images into living works. Kurt Cobain, monta montage of Heck, beautifully brought the artist's drawings and artworks onto a filmic canvas. Just as Bacon was touched by divine visitation, so too should we be on celluloid. Bacon, the elusive and dashing man in a hat, something under it with curls and a goatee. For a colour association, he was born of the purple. Pot paper mark decorations, the number and complexity of each individual pot mark. Truth, the daughter of time, represented as a naked young woman emerging out of a dark cave who flying satin leads out by the right hand. Athena, Goddess of Wisdom, the divine spear shaker, patroness of the arts and sciences. This feminine symbol carries a powerful meaning as the patriarchal society was part of the problem with learning. The Gemini, twins, opposites, light and dark, a key to the works found atop the Trinity Monument. The Phoenix, along with Ovid's notion of metamorphosis and Bacon disappearing into the work. In decrypting his secrets, may we then allow a transformation back into the man, an absolved one? Ships, a symbol of Bacon's works. How much more are letters to be valued, which, like ships, pass through the vast ocean of time and convey knowledge and inventions to the remotest ages? Our image is of a ship sailing, ancient black and dimensional, flying off the cover of the advancement of learning and into the star-clad skies. The relevance. Though every age feels this, we are currently on a very fast road to another. In Bacon's time, just 5% of the population could read or write, compared with 84% now. With the internet and digitisation of literature, surely we're obligated to be more thorough with resources, to analyse historical evidence afresh in order to shed imposed frameworks of centuries past. The project should promote this message, particularly through the CR character. Bacon proposed a model in which man could coexist with his fellow man without the divine right of kings, and the new tools that the magic of science would one day bring could also be in harmony with nature. Bacon was always very concerned about the preservation of things of worth, especially wisdom and knowledge, so that such things would survive the dark times he foresaw coming. Will we expand with technology? or devolve into conflict. Civilization 2.0 is coming. Here are some of the important thematic links to be explored throughout the piece. Concealment. Concealing identity was common within this period of history, but the need for secrecy in all areas of Bacon's life has generated a great sense of mystery about him, along with a great deal of ignorance. He lived a life in shadow, as a child of royal blood, along with his brother Essex, as a diplomat and spy working with Cypher. As a writer, the use of a pen name was critical as literature, literature could involve authors in criminal punishment. As a spiritual leader, Pop believed that Bacon was uh, at the centre of a group who sought to raise our consciousness. As a concealed poet, poetry could hinder a nobleman's political career and theatres were dens of iniquity. Love. The piece must revolve around the Shakespearean, Baconian form of love as experienced by the three central characters. Fraternity. Here we acknowledge the collectives Bacon led 
was a part of and continues to inspire to this day. Bacon's many overlapping circles become evident in those he surrounds himself with. The poets in France under Ronsard and his Pleiades. Law at Gray's Inn. Bacon is acclaimed by the lawyers as being the great one who inspired, led and wrote for them. The Rosicrucians, which Dawkins calls a fellowship as there were men and women members. Dee passes on the torch to Bacon, who assumes leadership of the movement. The Shakespeare Circle, inspired by Philip Sidney's Areopagus poetry group. The advancement of learning. Bacon confessed, most men study to live. I live to study. Learning is a shared passion for the three protagonists. They are all raised in a hothouse as such and have deeply inquiring minds. The Shakespeare authorship question. Jackson puts an important element of the playwriting process into the mouths of Bacon and Marlowe during a conjured conversation. There are basically three sources of inspiration. Firstly, personal experience. This is the most important. Then there is history. There are many historical events that can be adapted to new circumstances. Finally, there is the works of other writers, including the classics. Even a piece of work that was not particularly well done can often have a good idea that can be modified, improved upon, expanded and put into a new context. So if you come across anything interesting in your travels to Germany, by all means, bring it back to us. Sir Francis Bacon. The notion that the work simply arrived at Shakespeare's quill is all the more fanciful when we consider Bacon, his work and his processes. I keep asking myself, how did Bacon and Shakespeare not meet, mention or refer to each other when these two geniuses with so much in common were sharing the city a size of Swindon for 30 years? Bacon's advancement of learning describes theatre when used in the correct way as the perfect instrument for educational purposes. Shakespeare being the perfect example, but curiously, Bacon is silent on that one. Plays. Plays. We have here the opportunity to track representations of the text meaningfully across three respective ages. As you like it, just as with All's Well is an example of a work that may highlight collaboration in connection with a candidate. We can explore the Marlowe mystery as the dead shepherd, another member of the circle most worthy of attention. Unlike Shax, he's a real working class genius writer with a rich and traceable life experience. Examples, The Merchant of Venice. Finally, we find an explanation for the love shared between Antonio and Bassanio. Fun fact, Anthony and derivatives of is the most often used male name in the plays. Merchant is a portrayal of our brothers as Democritus, and Heraclitus, Bacon always looking at life through a lens of jest, Anthony of earnestness. Miles shows how Shylock embodies the underlying anxiety in the play about being eaten as a matter of consumption, pertinent for Bacon and also very present in Timon. The Tempest. The autobiographical feel of Tempest is something widely acknowledged. Given pride of place in the folio, Prospero's epilogue feels very deliberately added and placed here in order to tell us something. We believe it is Bacon saying, I'm leaving you with all I have to offer, the works. It's about being pardoned and set free, dissolving. The first letter and concluding word of the Tempest contain Bacon's signature. One final iPhone creation then. But release me from my bands with the help of your good hands. Gentle breath of yours, my sails must fill, or else my project fails, which was to please. Now I want spirits to enforce, art to enchant, and my ending is despair, unless I be relieved by prayer, which pierces so that it assaults mercy itself and frees all faults. As you from crimes would pardon be, let your indulgence set me free. The Tempest, Sir Francis Bacon. Next steps. 
to get support and a dramaturg to quest with me in consulting our great Baconian minds in order to create a screenplay, to pool resources in order to make something worthy of our chief before the folio turns 400. Don't have a shack attack, find where the party's at, Posse 33.